Good evening, everyone. It is 7.30 on this Wednesday evening. Welcome to Bridgepoint Community Church. And this is our weekly Wednesday night online Bible study. We're glad that you're joining us. I see a few of you on Zoom and um, the rest of you are watching on Facebook Live, however you're watching this. Or even if it's a recording from uh, a few days from now, we're glad that you took the time uh, to listen why don't we begin with a word of prayer and let's welcome the presence of the Lord in each and every one of our homes and let us pray. Father in heaven, how wonderful that in the middle of this week we can still take time to pray for one another, to study your word, and to be enriched by the scriptures. And we pray that your spirit will be with each and every one of us. A lot of us have come from a full day of work, and although our bodies might be tired, our spirits are willing to learn and so fill our mind and our hearts with every good thing so that we can return it to you in worship and service to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, before we do our study today, I'd like to welcome Rhea. Rhea will lead us in a song of worship. Good evening, everybody. Um, let's sing a song together and just um, be in a spirit of worship um, tonight. It's an old song, something that we should all know. Um, and let's just take a few minutes and just focus on our Father, um, spend this moment of, um, of worship with Him. When the music came, all this stripped away, and I simply Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Rio. What a wonderful reminder that especially this holiday season, it may be a lot of different things to different people, but in the end, it really needs to be about Christ and the proper response is, oh, come, let us adore him. Worship is always the proper response to the knowledge of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Well, this is our, if I'm not mistaken, this is our first um, Bible study for December. Um, and so what I want to do for the next couple of Wednesdays is to focus on the key people that were involved in what we know today as the Christmas story. And so I'd like to begin with a general question. Uh, and the question is, who are those people in my nativity scene? Uh, that's the question that will be guiding us uh, for every Wednesday that we will be meeting. If uh, you grew up like me, every Christmas season, almost every home had this nativity scene in one form or another. Uh, in the Philippines, I think we call this the Belen. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what the origin of that word is, but I'm sure it has something to do with, you know, the structure or the, the celebration. And um, it's not a culturally accurate depiction of the birth of Christ, but it's certainly one that's very festive and We'll talk about some of those details today. But in every nativity scene, you have these characters, you have these, you know, uh, figurines, and each one of them have a specific role in the Christmas story. And so I wanted to ask the question, who are all these people? And I'm going to break them down into the three major groups of people that you see in the nativity scene. Uh, the first, of course, will be sort of what we call the stars of the show, which is the Holy Family, the, uh, the combination of Joseph, Mary, and then subsequently Jesus. So we'll talk about that today. Next week, we're going to focus on that other group that's in the scene called the Shepherds. And then on our third gathering before Christmas, we will talk about uh, what we traditionally call the three kings. The Bible does not use the term three kings the Bible instead uses the word wise men or the magi or magi. So we look at those three different groups. And for today, as I mentioned, we are going to look at the making of the holy family, the holy family. Um, this term holy family is actually coined, you know, within the traditional Christian uh, movements, uh, in, in the Philippines growing up, you know, when you said holy family, everyone pr practically knew what that was. That was Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Uh, if you go to Spain, especially in Barcelona, uh, the most famous church there is the Sagrada Familia. Sagrada Familia or the Sacred Family. And that's exactly what they celebrate in that church. You know, the, the Jesus being born in the family of Joseph and Mary. So we'll talk about this. And so there are... Um, We'll talk about Jesus more towards Christmas. So really the two people we want to focus on today are Joseph and Mary. And how did they become a part of this wonderful story of Christ being born and becoming like one of us? So we're going to look at two different passages of scripture. Every Christmas, uh, when you hear a Christmas uh, scripture being read in church, and it comes from the Gospels, it will likely come from either Matthew or Luke. Uh, Matthew and Luke combined really provide the most 
cohesive and accurate depiction of how the birth of Christ came to be. And interestingly, one emphasizes unique things over the other. So we will look at two passages of scripture. We will look at the Gospel of Luke to learn about how Mary became part of the Holy Family. And then later on, we will look at Matthew to find out how Joseph became a part of this. And you're going to see actually uh, sort of these two scriptures intertwined at certain points because obviously it's talking about the same event. So the first one that we will talk about is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. And this is often known as the Annunciation, the Annunciation or the Day of the Announcement. And so let me read Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38 for you. You can follow along, but you can also just listen as I read it. Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. He was a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. You know, this is a very interesting story for those of us that have um, had the privilege of visiting the promised land or Israel. Uh, we actually had the chance to uh, stop by for, I think, an afternoon or an evening in this town called Nazareth. And uh, Nazareth is very different now from what it used to be. But if you can kind of use your imagination, and Nazareth is a, a very uh, sort of out of the way town. It's not very significant as far as the Jewish people were concerned. It was uh, really in the general region of Galilee. But it was so insignificant that for news to happen in Nazareth was a surprise for many. And so we can assume that this town of just uh, probably a few hundred people um, was the most unlikely place that you would think uh, the announcement of a savior, the Messiah, would take place. If you were a Jewish, uh, a conscientious Jewish follower of scripture, you would think that the announcement of the savior would take place in Jerusalem, for instance, uh, or some other major center of uh, world events. But it happens in this little town, the small town of Nazareth, and there's a woman there. In the English Bible, her name is Mary, but in, the, in, in those days, they would have called her Miriam. And Miriam was a very young woman at that time. Most scholars agree that she probably was in her early teens. Some put it as late or as young as 13. Uh, some people put her as old as 15 to 16. But the general consensus is that Mary was probably around 14 years old uh, when this story happens. Now, that might be scandalous to uh, the modern person, but you have to understand that in the ancient world, there were really two phases to life. One is childhood, and the second is adulthood. Uh, unlike in our world today, there's childhood, there's adolescence, and then there's adulthood, right? So that adolescence in the middle is usually what we call the teenage years. You're no longer quite a child, but you're not quite an adult. Well, that distinction uh, was not part of Jewish culture. In Jewish culture, if you were no longer a child, then therefore you are an adult. And at 14, 15, 16, uh, you were already prepared to get married and start a family. And if you were a, a, a male member of society, you're expected to learn a craft and work a job. So families started very young in those days, uh, in their, their teenage years. But either way, 14 is really quite young if you think about it. You know, imagine if those of you that are, are women in this uh, Bible study, remember, try to think back when you were 14. You know, what was life like? What were you thinking? What were your interests? You know, what were you looking forward to? What was a day like for you at 14 years old? And then put yourself in Mary's shoes or sandals and say, can you imagine her going about her day? Maybe she took care of the chores in the house. Maybe she's about ready to deal with something else, cook some food, maybe help her mom. And then all of a sudden, there's this angel that appears, the angel Gabriel appears to her 
and he greets her by saying, greetings, you who are highly favored. Now let's look at her reaction in verse 29. It says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words. <laughs> Wouldn't you, right? <laughs> if some guy out of nowhere shows up in your house, uh, even though the greeting might sound pleasant, you who are highly favored, you'd be wondering where did this guy sh uh, come from and why is he here? And she was troubled by that and troubled meaning um, surprised, shocked, right? She was wondering what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel then said to her, do not be afraid. So the estimation of the angel is that uh, her reaction was one of some degree of fear, like, oh, oh no, what's going to happen? What is this all about? But he says to her, do not be afraid. You have found favor with God, Mary, the angel said. And then you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. Now, here's the troubling part for Mary. It's not that she was predicted to be a mom someday. That's normal. You know, and we know that at this point in the story, Joseph and Mary are already what we call betrothed. In other words, they are already legally engaged to be married within a year. So there is an expectation that shortly after being married, at any point after that, she could be pregnant, she could be a mom. So being a mom was certainly part of Mary's plan for her life, but certainly not under the circumstances that the angel is telling her. Because there are several problems. Number one, even though they are betrothed, they're not yet quite married. Legally, they're bound, but they are not yet uh, legally able to live together and sleep with each other, thereby causing a pregnancy. So that was problem number one. Problem number two is, by Mary's own admission, she had never slept with any man before and had no intention to do so until she would be married to her husband, Joseph. And so her objection in verse 34 is Mary says to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the word virgin there could mean many things. It, sometimes it means a young lady. But in this case, we know that the word virgin means someone who is sexually untouched because the response of the angel is not in, on her age as a young lady, but on her condition of not ever having been with a man in an intimate fashion before. So the angel says, um, you know, aside from saying, don't be afraid, he explains to her how this will happen. And by the way, this also allows us to get into Mary's mind that even though she certainly as a conscientious wife in the future planned to give her husband children, her understanding is that the, the baby this angel is talking about is going to be a pre-marriage pregnancy, which would be highly problematic, you know, for a woman in her status. She's engaged, and yet the angel says she's already going to be pregnant before they get married. The explanation of the angel is found in verse 35. The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Very interesting language. There's the language here is actually a parallel to uh, a passage in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. You remember that passage in Genesis? When the Spirit hovered over the waters, what was the result of that act? That the heavens and the earth that God created began to sprout life. You know, there was the light that was created, there was vegetation, there was uh, sea creatures, creatures of the air, land animals, and subsequently uh, Adam and Eve in whom was given the breath of life. So the connection is that when the Holy Spirit overshadows uh, something, he is in the business of bringing about life. The Holy Spirit, after all, one of his titles is life giver. So when the angel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, that is the exact language 
of Genesis 1, where it says the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. So it's almost like the womb of Mary is like, is like this new creation where God, just as God created the heavens and the earth and the Holy Spirit gives it life, God gave Mary a body with the capacity to have a child, and it is the presence of the Holy Spirit that would allow her to be with child. And so we know this phenomenon as the virginal conception. You know, we often use the term virgin birth uh, in, in our language, but it's not, the miracle is not so much the virgin birth. The miracle is actually the virginal conception because the birth was a normal birth. You know, she, she gave birth to Jesus the way a woman would normally give birth to a child. So that was, that was human and that was normal. What was uh, suprahuman is that she became pregnant without any sexual intimacy with a man. And that's what we, after all, call a miracle. Uh, don't ask me to explain how that happened. Don't ask me to give you a medical you know, report on how that took place. That's something that we receive from Scripture as a matter of faith. It's part of our faith system that the reason Jesus was born in the flesh was because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, at that point, you can, you can do a lot of things if you're Mary. You can say, uh, no, not me. I mean, I'd rather not. Or you could say, I don't know how that quite works, so I don't think it's going to happen. Or you can give a, a number of uh, excuses or explanations. It kind of reminds me of Moses when God called him through the burning bush. Moses came up with a list of why he was the wrong person uh, to be called to liberate the uh, the Hebrews from Egypt, Moses said, "I'm uh, I'm a reject from e Egypt. I don't speak well. Will they even listen to me?" You know, Moses gave excuses while uh, the the burning bush, the voice of the Lord, was speaking to him. Mary could have done the same thing. She could have said, "I'm too young. I'm not yet married. That's going to be a public scandal, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And yet what's amazing about Mary is that after the angel gave this explanation, even using Elizabeth as an example of how God can miraculously open your womb, um, the angel gives this explanation. She said that what is impossible with man is impossible with God, for the word of God will never fail. And then look at Mary's response. Instead of giving excuses or reasons why it should not be, Mary simply answered by saying, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left. Why did the angel leave? His job there was over. He had passed on the message. The message was received and mission was accomplished. So that's the, the Mary part of the story. That's where Miriam, you know, learns that she's going to be with child. However, that's not the end of the dilemma, right? Because now that you're with child, how are you going to explain to your fiance that before you got married and before you had the ability to consummate your marriage, you are already pregnant? I don't know how long Mary waited before she told Joseph. I, maybe she prolonged it for as long as she could. But, you know, as that, as that womb starts to grow, you can't hide that for very long. You know, I imagine maybe the third month, fourth month, certainly the fifth month, it would already have begun to show. And uh, Joseph would already have been suspicious at that point. So to get Joseph's point of view, we have to go to another book of the Bible, and we have to look at Matthew. And what's interesting is that although Gabriel appeared to Mary in real time and had a real conversation with her, with Joseph, the means of communication was a little different. In this case, it was a dream. And let's try to figure out the story and find out why the dream was the better way to communicate. But let's look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says this. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, having read Luke, you know it's by the Spirit, I know it's by the Spirit, and Mary knows that she's pregnant by the Spirit. 
However, Joseph doesn't know that, right? Because let's let's be real here. If your fiance is pregnant and you did not sleep with her, what is the only logical explanation for her pregnancy? There aren't two, three different explanations. There's only one. The explanation is she was impregnated by someone other than him, whether it was willful on her part or whether she was forced in the situation. That's a different argument. But it, the, the point being, Joseph knew he was not responsible for that pregnancy. And so he had to figure out, what do I do since my wife is either unfaithful or has been put in a precarious situation where the child does not belong to me? Now, it goes on to say in verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a faithful man and faithful to the law, but he did not want to expose her in public disgrace. Joseph had in mind to simply divorce her quietly. Joseph had a choice. He could have publicly stood before the people of Nazareth and said, Mary is with child. I, I wash my hands off this. I'm not responsible for this. I am innocent in all of this. She got pregnant without me. And obviously she is unfaithful or she was forced in a situation that would have cleared his name. The problem is it would have tainted Mary's name. She would have been uh, a social shame. She would probably be an outcast in her own hometown. And because Joseph was a conscientious, righteous man, he did not want to put Mary in that situation. So rather than publicly shaming her, he decided to quietly divorce her. Now, why divorce? They're not married yet. Because in Jewish law, when you are betrothed or engaged, you are as good as married because legally you're already bound together, although you won't be married for another year. But the only way to dissolve that relationship is by divorce. Now, divorce was very simple in the ancient world. You basically ask a scribe to write on a document, I thereby divorce you, sign your name, have it signed by a witness, and you hand that paper to your uh, fiance or to your wife. And upon receipt of that piece of paper, you are legally divorced. It was really that simple. Now, the responsibility of the woman is she was to hold on to that paper for the rest of her life because that paper was the only proof that she had been released from her obligation to the, to the marriage. And that was the only way for her to show that she was um, legitimately let go uh, by her husband. So that was a, a document that she kept for the rest of her life. Now, Mary's option, if Joseph pushed through with this, was... Joseph would give her the certificate of divorce. Mary could accept it quietly without any public um, you know, uh, shame. And then Mary could simply move to another town so that she, would, she could give birth away from Nazareth. And hopefully no one would find out about it or no one would make a big deal about it. So that was the plan. But obviously this was not God's plan. So just as God communicated with Mary what the plan was. God had to communicate the same thing to Joseph so that he would be in the same boat as Mary and understand the call. So here's how the story goes on in verse 20 of Matthew 1. But after Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So rather than appearing to him you know, in the way he did to Mary, he did it in a dream. Uh, I, I'm not sure why, you know, but all I know about dreams is that, you know, you're, you're in a calmer situation because you're asleep. I'm sure um, Joseph was, was probably livid at this point. He was probably pacing the floor. He was wondering, why did Mary do this? You know, uh, this, this could have been a great love story. This could have been a good family. He was probably thinking all these things in his head. And probably got so tired overthinking this that he fell asleep that God waited for him to calm down in his spirit. And then in a dream, he could speak to him. Also, it had to be an angelic dream because I don't think any amount of human explanation would have satisfied Joseph as far as an alternative to why Mary is pregnant. So this is what happened in the dream. 
the, the Lord appeared through the angel and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So there's the explanation. But the line is loaded. You know, first of all, he says to uh, Joseph, he says, Joseph, son of David. Now, interestingly, David's dad is not named, uh, Joseph's dad is not named David. So why does the angel call him Joseph, the son of David? Well, the word son of doesn't mean that David is your immediate dad. The word son of simply means a descendant of. And one thing we learn in Matthew is that Joseph <clears throat> is a descendant of David. What does that make him? That makes him part of the kingly line of the Israelites. Now, remember, in the Old Testament, the promise is from the seed of David will come the Messiah. That was a known prophecy at that point. The question is which seed? Because um, hundreds of years later, David would already have multiple descendants. So no one really knew which descendant would be uh, the responsible parent. And by calling him Joseph, son of David, it's almost as if the angel was reminding him, don't forget, you are part of the promise. It is through your your uh, your forefather's line that the Messiah will come. And I'm here to tell you, you are the chosen one. Just like Mary was chosen to be the bearer of the child Jesus, Joseph was called to be responsible to be the father, the earthly father of the Messiah. And then it goes on to say that Mary will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus. It was the father's responsibility to give the name. So the woman gave birth to the child, but the father had to be the one to bless that birth with a name. And the reason for the name Jesus, it simple, simply says, because he will save his people from sins. The word Jesus, uh, in, in his day, he would have been called Yeshua, or in the Old Testament, we know it as Joshua. That is the name. And even though um, Joseph may have had another name in mind. We will find out later that he will show obedience to God's word. In fact, it says in verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, Emmanuel is not the actual name of the Christ. That's more of a title. The name of the Christ would be Yeshua or Jesus. His title would be Emmanuel because Emmanuel, El meaning God, Imanu means uh, close or near. Emmanuel simply means God is here, God is with us. So the birth of Christ is the fulfillment of God being born and living among men. And then look at Joseph's response in verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. Did you notice that Mary, when she heard the word of the Lord, responded with instant obedience? Let it be unto me, according to the word, Mary said. Joseph also responded with instant obedience. He said, as soon as he woke up, he did what the angel told him to do. And what did he do? He took Mary as his wife, and then uh, they, were, they were together, but the Bible says he did not consummate their marriage until after Mary gives birth, and then he gave them the name Jesus. What was the sacrifice of Joseph? Because we know Mary's sacrifice. Mary's sacrifice is that she would be shamed, maybe for the rest of her life, because when people do the math, they will count that Mary gives birth to Jesus less than nine months from the time she was betrothed or married, meaning they're always going to conclude, oh, she got pregnant before they actually were legally married. So that was her sacrifice, the, the willingness to live with that shame. What was Joseph's sacrifice? I think his sacrifice is he was willing to take the blame for Mary's early pregnancy, even though he knew he was not the reason she was pregnant. He, he basically said, I will take that shame. Let that shame not be upon my wife. Let that shame be upon me. I will be responsible for people knowing that Mary got pregnant before we were married. And so the blame will go to me 
And I think for the rest of his life, Joseph became known in the small town of Nazareth as the man who got his wife pregnant before they got married. Can you imagine the sacrifice of this couple? Could you do something like that today? Would you be willing to go through such a shame in order to fulfill God's plan? And why would God even let this happen? What a strange way to fulfill a prophecy. Well, let me wrap this up by uh, trying to share with you as many lessons that I can think of, uh, and then we'll leave room for more as you ponder this story. But let's look at uh, what happens as a result of their obedience. It says in Luke chapter 2, while they, already married, were in Bethlehem, the time came for a baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So the, the end of this story, this part of the story is, is the one that we know very well. On the way from Galilee, from Nazareth to, to Bethlehem, because there was a census that was called for, while they were in Bethlehem, the time for Mary to give birth came. Now look at the language of Luke. It says, Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Why is Jesus called Mary's firstborn? Because Mary will have other children. So the Holy Family in reality, it's not just Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. That family would eventually be a big family because we know that uh, Mary will have four other boys aside from Jesus. Their names are found in Matthew uh, 13. And then we know that Jesus also had sisters. So we know that Jesus had four other brothers, sisters meaning two or more. So Mary and Joseph actually had a big family. That's why Jesus is called the firstborn rather than the only child. So look at the difference here. Jesus is called Mary's firstborn, but she is called God's only begotten. Because God has only one son, but because Mary had more than one child, she, he is not called Mary's only son. He is called Mary's first son, one of many. And then she wraps him in cloths and places him in a manger. And I think the NIV got this correct. It says, because there was no guest room available for them. Some Bibles say that there was no room in the inn. And that can be a little confusing. Because when we think of an inn, we think of a motel, right? Holiday Inn, uh, Best Western, right? Uh, no such thing. No such thing. Uh, at least in Bethlehem, because Bethlehem was only about five miles away from Jerusalem. And it is in Jerusalem that you find uh, rooms for hire. Because if, if you already made it to Bethlehem, which is a small town, you wouldn't rent a room in Bethlehem. You would just travel the, another five miles and you would rent a room in Jerusalem. So the word in is actually inaccurate. The, the word in in the, in the original language is the word room, or more specifically, guest room. Now, where would Mary and Joseph have found a guest room? My hunch is they went to one of Joseph's relatives. Remember this. Joseph's family is from Bethlehem. Okay? When Joseph goes to Bethlehem, he's not going to rent a hotel. Because that would be a social shame in the first century. In the first century, when you have a relative in town, it is an insult for them to rent a room to live in. Because as, you're, as a family member, you are obligated to open your home to a family member that is visiting. So most likely, Joseph and Mary went to one of the houses of a relative. However, because there were so many relatives in town for the census, there was no corner in the house, no guest room that was appropriate to give birth. So what Mary and Joseph had to do is they had to leave the actual house structure. And then they had to go to the back of the house, maybe a cave, where they would put the animals. Like the garage is the equivalent of a garage. And then that's where Mary gave birth. And so as you can tell... The way the story unfolds in the Bible is very different from the nativity scene that we display in our Christmas uh, malls and houses, right? But this is how the story unfolds. And the more you read it, the more you understand how it actually took place. Now, having said that, 
uh, what are some of the lessons that we learn from the Holy Family? Let me share with you, you know, a couple. Number one, the first lesson I learned is that we should never confuse favor with ease. Favor with ease. What do I mean by this? Just because God finds favor in you, it doesn't mean your life will be easy. Okay, think about that. I see this all the time in social media, right? Oh, I'm, I'm favored. I was upgraded to first class in my flight, right? Or people would say, oh, I'm so favored. I got a raise and now I don't have to worry about this, that, or the other. Or I'm so favored I was given a promotion. You know, see, in modern times, we think of favor as something good happening. You know, something that makes our life easier, that makes it more comfortable. But in the Bible, when you are favored by God, expect that your life actually will get difficult. Because the favor does not mean your life will be easy. It means that your life will be meaningful, but it will involve sacrifices. Mary found favor in the eyes of God. Joseph found favor in the eyes of God. And yet for the rest of their lives, they will suffer under a, a, a gossiping community that would murmur about how they got pregnant before they got married. They would question their relationship and they would go through a lot of hardship as a, as a married couple. They will see their son despised. They will see their son rejected and Mary will see her son nailed to a cross someday. But she's favored. But this does not mean that her life would be easy. So stop daydreaming that just because your life is favored, it should be problem free. It doesn't mean that at all. Lesson number two, always be open to God's way of doing things. Chances are the way you think something should be done is not exactly the way God will decide it should be done. If you were Joseph and Mary, wouldn't you say to God, can you wait for us to get married? So at least we can legitimately be pregnant and no one would question it. Or can, can we be pregnant like, after the census so that we don't have to travel to Bethlehem and, and go through this, you know, this arduous journey of 90 miles um, with a donkey and, and with a pregnant woman, you know, surely there's a better way, right? Could, 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 you, could you do this in a better place? Could, could you make this happen? You know, we're always giving God advice on the best way to do his will. But maybe like Joseph and Mary, we should listen and say, God, I don't understand your ways. I don't know why you're doing it this way, but I'm going to be open to your way of doing it. And maybe the best response is like what Mary said, let it be unto me according to your word. In other words, according to your will, let it happen. That's an act of faith. Number three connected to that is obey even when it is difficult. And I might suggest obey because it will always be difficult. There's nothing easy about doing God's will. There's nothing simple about walking into the arena of what God wants to do. It always demands a sacrifice. Moses sacrificed his stay in the desert to be ridiculed by the Egyptians. You know, Abraham sacrificed the luxuries of living in Ur of the Chaldeans to go to a land in his old age where he would start a new family. David would have to step out of his comfort zone and challenge a giant, even though everyone thought he would fail. Yet what do all these people have in common? They obeyed even when it was difficult. Is God asking you to do something difficult today? Are you willing to obey? And how instantaneous is your willingness to obey? Mary obeyed instantly. Joseph obeyed instantly. I think we should do the same. Number four, we should trust God's timing. What was bad timing for Mary and bad timing for Joseph is perfect timing in the will of God. Because the question is never, what is God's will for me? The real question is, what is God's will, period? What does he want? As Lord, as leader, as master, it is his way that is followed. His timing is always perfect. And one final uh, lesson I would share with you is praise him no matter what. No matter how difficult life is, no matter how challenging the situation is, praise him just the same. Are you going through hard times tonight? Is this a difficult time of the year? 
you know, we often say Christmas is the happiest time of the year, but that's not true for everyone. For some people, Christmas is a time of loss. Christmas is a time of remembering a loved one who had passed away. For many people in uh, the Bay Area, Christmas is a time of being laid, laid off from big companies. You know, um, it's a tough time. And Christmas is not always a happy time. Christmas is not always a merry time. But are you willing to praise him just the same? Because I didn't read it to you, but if you read the rest of Luke chapter 1, Mary, in response to the news of the angel, she sings a song of praise to God. It starts with the line, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And then she sings this whole song in praise to the Lord because she is honored that God had chosen her. It will be a hard life. It will be a difficult life. But she chose to praise him just the same. I challenge you today to be a worshiper who does not rely on the circumstance to be favorable, but will worship God in spirit and in truth, no matter what is going on in the world around us. Maybe that's the ultimate lesson of Mary and Joseph. One of the best sermons I heard on this story was actually preached by Sister Tamina a year ago. I asked her, I challenged her to preach a sermon on the question, why did God choose Mary and Joseph? Of all the humans, of all the people, why this couple? Why this man? Why this woman? And one of Tamina's answers was because God looked at their heart and discovered that Mary and Joseph would love Jesus the same way he loves the son. I think that was the best answer she came up with, that when he looked at their heart, he found loving people, a man and a woman who would suffer the shame and would defend their child to the very end, because that's the kind of love a parent gives. They would worship God. They would praise him no matter what. So I'll leave you with that lesson. I encourage you to read the rest of Luke chapter 1. Uh, so that you can get the rest of the story and then reread Matthew 1 just to appreciate what Joseph went through. And in both cases, I pray that you're encouraged by the first uh, exploration that we have of who are these people in the nativity scene, the Holy Family, very special and very precious indeed. Before I let you go, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this message uh, through an act of generosity and faith. If today is the, one of the days that you would like to uh, give a, uh, some support to the work that we do. Uh, there is one slide that's uh, shown. I don't know how big it is in your screen, but uh, it's the slide on how to give online. Uh, you can use a couple of apps that you may be used to, Zelle, Venmo, Pop Money, uh, or you can just use the QR code that's on the screen and it will lead you to the church website, bridgepointcc.com. You can click on give in the menu bar and uh, prepare your offering or if uh, you would rather wait till Sunday and put your offering in the, uh, the basket through an envelope, that is fine as well. We're just grateful that you have been so blessed to share your blessings with the work of God throughout the world through the ministry of Bridgepoint. And as you prepare your offering today, I'd like to invite uh, Sister Avin to um, come to us, open her microphone, and lead us in an offering prayer. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Avin. Uh, I will be reading a portion in Matthew 5, and that is 22 to 24. And it reads, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or a sister, Raka, I just looked it up, and that means worthless or empty, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift in the front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with them and then come and offer your gift. You know, what was uh, what struck me here is that line on verse 23, when it said um, in this version, 
if you if if you are offering your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, then leave your gift at the front of the altar before you can offer your offering to God. So it was a good reminder for us today as we prayed um, during our prayer time that sometimes it is not just us who, who feel offended, but for most of the time we neglect to see that sometimes it is us that offends someone. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're blind to that or blindsided to that. And it's a good reminder that before we can offer our offering to God, we have to go through that cleansing, that examination time in searching our hearts if we are right with God. So in this, I'd like us to pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to give you thanks and praise. Thank you for the night lesson that you have given to us. It is truly wonderful, Lord, to know one of the lines that the pastor emphasized it is in obedience, the heart of obedience that you look into your children, not the sacrifices, not the gifts that we can give. Although that's part of our walk with you, with all the blessings that you give unto us. As well, O oh Lord God, remembering that whatever the situation may be, whether it is us who has offended someone or others who has offended us, the Lord has asked us in brokenness and in, in humility to go to that person first and be reconciled before we can lift up our petitions to you. So, Father, tonight we ask forgiveness. We ask, oh Lord God, that in this filthy world that we live in, it will always allow your Holy Spirit to give us the conviction to search our hearts. And forgive us, Father, forgive us if we have done anything that is not pleasing before you. And along with this, Lord God, for all the bountiful blessings that you have given to us, we would like to return a portion of it to you. Father, allow us to be reminded that during this holiday season, this Christmas season, sometimes we get so tied up and get so busy, especially, Lord, in getting all these gifts to give to our family, to our friends. Father, remind us that there are people who are so much more in need. So allow us to have a heart, a portion of our giving be allotted in that aspect of, of how you want us to share your blessings. And thank you, Lord, that you allow this church to, to be a blessing in a lot of ways the people in the Philippines and probably Lord organizations here locally in San Francisco and where we are. We, we thank you, Lord, that you um, allow us to be a part of, of being a blessing to someone, to a family, to an organization, oh Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to be reminded not to be so self-absorbed, especially during this holiday season. But instead, Father, to be, just be broken and just to be selfless and just to share whatever we can, oh Lord God. So, Father, again, thank you so much. And for the rest of the days to come and the weeks to come, Father, we thank you. Give us a good rest. And for the moment that we close our eyes, Father, be with us. And tomorrow morning, Father, as we open our eyes, allow us to utter the first word of thanking you for another day that you will give. Again, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for all and everything that you give to us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Avin. And with that, uh, we bring our Wednesday night study to a close. And hopefully you'll follow us in the next couple of Wednesdays as we explore the different people that are surrounding that nativity scene and we learn more about them uh, if you'd like to say hello and goodbye to the group in Zoom, you can turn on your uh, cameras if you wish and uh, greet one another. Other than that, you are dismissed. Thank you so much.